In my last video, I built a custom mechanical keyboard called the Alpha. That build was really fun, but it ended up sending me down the rabbit hole of researching custom mechanical keyboards again, and specifically ergonomic keyboards. While researching keyboards to purchase for myself, I came across the ZSA Voyager, which is a beautifully designed ergonomic mechanical keyboard, and it seemed to have everything that I was looking for. And then I went to buy one and saw the price. No, God, please, no, no, no. But as the days went by, I thought a little bit more about it. I decided to do what any reasonable maker would do, build my own Voyager inspired keyboard from scratch. I'll show you how I did it. And I could not be more happy with the end result. So let's get started. Before I dive into the build itself, let's talk about the vision and design objectives I want to meet. First, the keyboard obviously needs to be ergonomic. The layout should make typing feel natural and put less strain on my hands and wrists. Second, I want to keep the design low profile. I love the aesthetic of a thin board, but this should also help reduce wrist fatigue. Finally, it needs to be affordable and relatively easy to build with readily available parts. To start tackling this build, my first task was to work on the layout. This is where a tool called Ergogen came in handy. Ergogen is a fantastic tool for generating ergonomic keyboard layouts and PCBs using a JSON configuration file. First, I defined the key layout with the staggered ortholinear columns and a few thumb keys. I then mirrored my layout so that both sides of the keyboard would be the same and tilted each side inwards by 15 degrees to hopefully help reduce wrist stress while using the keyboard. With the layout completed, I needed to create an outline for my PCB, which is ultimately what would define the final shape of the keyboard. And to be honest, this part of the process was pretty tedious. As amazing as Ergogen is, using it to define complex outlines manually isn't exactly its strength, and other tools like Fusion 360 are probably better suited for this task. Now it was time to define all of the components I wanted to use on my board. I decided to use the Pro Micro footprint as the brains of the keyboard, since they're cheap and easy to get no matter where you are in the world. I also added a footprint for an OLED display, which I can use to help me keep track of which layer is active on the keyboard when it's being used later. So back in Ergogen, I added the OLED and Pro Micro footprints to my list of components. With my work in Ergogen now complete, I downloaded the PCB file it generated to begin working on the actual PCB design using KiCad. I started here since the PCB is central to the rest of the keyboard design. And then came my first real challenge routing the traces. I used a duplex matrix layout. This was necessary in order to fit all the keys within the available input and output pins of the board. This made the routing pretty complex as there's a limited amount of space for me to work with on either side of the board. This is definitely the part of the build that took the longest. It took hours of planning, adjusting, and optimizing all of these traces to get them to fit appropriately on the board. There were definitely a couple of tricky spots, but after a few revisions and double checking all of the connections, the PCB design was finally done. Because I've used them a couple of times before with really good results, I decided to go with JLC PCB. Their ordering process is super simple. All you need to do is upload the Gerber zip files, change any settings that you want to, such as the color of your PCB, and click order. Wait a couple of weeks and you'll have your PCB in hand. While I waited for my PCBs to be delivered, it was time to work on the next task, designing the case. I wanted to keep a low profile design that would be really easy to print and assemble. This was my first time using Fusion 360, so I went through quite a few iterations. I split the case itself into two parts, a base with standoffs to support and secure the PCB using screws, and a top plate which would be held in place by the key switches. I also made sure that the design would fit on a wide variety of printer beds to improve the ease of making your own board. Oh, and for those who are interested, this design also works great on CNC's as well. So more on that in an upcoming video. With the case now sorted, it was time to tackle the firmware. I used QMK, which is surprisingly fun to work with. Here you can see me defining the keyboard layout, assigning pins to the rows and columns. It's kind of like building a digital map of the keys. 
I configured the OLED to show the caps lock status, the current layer, and even a words per minute counter just for fun. I made sure that the firmware compiled and just in time too, as my PCBs had just arrived. So it was finally time to build. If you want to build one of these yourself, there are links to all of the components you'll need in the video description. The first thing to do is install the diodes. Diodes do have a right way and a wrong way to be installed. You'll see a black stripe on one side of the diode. Make sure that stripe faces the square pad on the PCB. Get that reversed and you'll end up with a key or keys that don't work and you'll end up having to disassemble your keyboard and re-solder. Pop them into place with the stripe facing the square pad and then solder them in from the back. After that, I grabbed a pair of snips and trimmed off the excess leads so everything sits flush on the front of the board. With the diodes complete, it's time to move on to the hot swap sockets. These handy little sockets let me swap out switches later on without needing to desolder anything. It's perfect if I ever want to experiment with a different feel or sound. As you can see, it has two contact points for each key. I line it up with the corresponding pads on the PCB, then solder it in place from the back side. Just take your time and ensure everything's aligned properly. Here's what your board should look like once all the hot swap sockets are installed. Now it was time to install the headers for the microcontroller. To keep this board as low profile as possible, I'm soldering them in upside down. This may seem odd at first, but this allows us the space that we need to be able to remove the plastic spacer once all the header pins are soldered. Using a pair of tweezers, I removed the plastic spacer from both sides of the headers. This step is crucial. By getting rid of that spacer, the microcontroller can sit nearly flush with the PCB. This helps keep the design as thin as possible. With the microcontroller in place and flush with the board, I soldered it in place and snipped off the excess header wire. Now it's time to add a little extra convenience to this board, a surface mount reset switch. The microcontroller I'm using already has a reset button built in, so this step isn't mandatory, but it definitely makes firmware flashing more convenient. Next, I turned my attention to the OLED display. I started by inserting the header pins into the PCB and then installing the OLED display on top of that. I want this display to be as straight as possible, so I use the silk screen lines on the PCB as a reference as I solder. With all the soldering work on the PCB pretty much done, I turned my attention to the 3D printed case. I tried out heat set inserts for the very first time and I'm already a huge fan. Once all the inserts were in place, I lined up the PCB with the bottom plate and secured it using 5mm M2 screws. It fits perfectly, and you can already see how slim this board is looking from the side. It's time to drop on the 3D printed top plate. I carefully lined it up so the screen slips right into the cutout. Next, I installed the Kale Chalk V1 switches through the top plate and into the PCB. These switches aren't as common as the Cherry MX alternatives, but they're super low profile, which was a huge goal for this build. Plus, you can still pick from tons of different chalk switch options for your preferred feel and sound. It's time for the final touch, keycaps. I'm using a set of Chalk Fox keycaps I found on Amazon. They're designed for the Chalk V1 switches, so they snap right into place. It's super satisfying at this point to see the board come together, and I cannot wait to test it. Now came the moment I had been waiting for for weeks, plugging this thing in and testing all the keys. At first, everything seemed fine until I realized an entire column on the right side wasn't responding at all. I immediately panicked a little bit and started checking my PCB schematics for any routing mistakes, but nope, everything looked good there. I also combed through my firmware to make sure the pins were assigned correctly and again, no issues. So I did what I had to do, and immediately after finishing the build, I took it all apart. Mercifully, within about 10 seconds, I found the issue. I had forgotten to solder the second pin on every single hot swap socket for that column. I pulled out my soldering iron and soldered the missed legs, reassembled the keyboard, and success. The column came back to life and everything worked perfectly. I'll walk you through all the features of the keyboard, but first, let's get to the beauty shots.
I am so proud of how this project turned out and I've decided to call it the Manta Ray. This keyboard is super low profile and it feels great to type on. The OLED display makes keeping track of the current layer and caps lock status a breeze. The entire keyboard costs under $100 to build, and most importantly, the whole thing is open source. The PCB design, case, and firmware, along with a detailed written build guide, are available on my GitHub page. Link in the description. If you've got ideas on how you could improve this build, or if you would have done something differently, go ahead and leave me a comment down below. I'd love to hear your thoughts. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.